Hi folks, welcome to AP Biofine with Dr. D, Chemistry of Life, A Tale of Water and Bonds in Three Acts, Act Two. And here we're going to specifically be talking about topic 1.1 of AP Biology course and exam description, properties of water. What you will see here is excerpts from the media um, sharing some exciting findings. One is that scientists found evidence of flowing water on Mars. The other one is evidence of gas erupting from Enceladus, which is a small moon with an ocean of liquid water beneath its icy crust. And these gases contain hydrogen. Scientists infer from that that there are hydrothermal chemical reactions similar to those that occur in hot fissures at the ocean bottoms on Earth. So the question is, why are we so giddy, so excited when we discover water or evidence of water on different planets? Because we are actually looking for evidence of water because we make a reasonable assumption, a hypothesis that um, life on other planets will require water just like it does on Earth. So why are we studying water? Well, all life occurs in water inside and outside of the cell. And we want to understand what makes water indispensable for life. So why are scientists looking for evidence of water on other planets? Why do they think that if we find water on other planets, that could mean that life exists on other planets? Water equals life, at least life as we know it. On our planet, life is not possible without water. And we will explore why that is in this presentation. This model, of water molecule explains all the properties of water. In the previous video, we talked about polar covalent bonds. So water contains two polar covalent bonds because oxygen is very electronegative. So it pulls the electrons, the shared electrons towards itself. Um, and it has a partial negative charge. The hydrogens are left with partial positive charge and the two Covalent bonds are polar and water is a polar molecule with partial charges. Because of that, water can form hydrogen bonds. One molecule of water can form four hydrogen bonds, two for each hydrogen and two for oxygen. The water molecules will stick to each other using these hydrogen bonds and this is called cohesion. And in the picture below, you will see one water molecule forming a hydrogen bond with another water molecule through one of its hydrogen, another hydrogen bonds through its other hydrogen with another water molecule, and two hydrogen bonds through its oxygen being able to form two hydrogen bonds with two other water molecule. This is called cohesion. Water is a sticky molecule. Water can also form hydrogen bonds with other polar or charged molecules, and this is called adhesion. So when polar molecules sticks or forms hydrogen bonds with other molecules, this is called adhesion. And in the picture of a leaf, water droplets on the leaf, what you are actually observing is both cohesion and adhesion. Cohesion because the water molecules within the droplet of water stick to each other and adhesion because the water molecules in the drop are also sticking to the surface of the leaf, which is really polar molecules on the surface of the plant cells. So water has several emergent properties which contribute to the earth sustainability for life. An emergent property is a property that a complex system has that is just more than the sum of its parts, okay? So the emergent properties of water that contribute to life are the fact that it's a nearly universal solvent, its ability to moderate temperature, it is expansion upon freezing, that means ice is less dense so it'll float, and it's cohesive and adhesive properties. And we're going to talk first about the nearly universal solvent feature. So water is a versatile solvent. It can dissolve many different substances due to its polarity. Again, its polarity explains the fact that it can dissolve many different substances. It allows it to form hydrogen bonds with many substances. And in the example below, 
um, water can dissolve very well ionic compounds. Ionic compounds, remember, are highly ordered crystal structures of ions. In this case, we have sodium chloride. Each ion is surrounded by a sphere of water molecules, which is called a hydration shell. So if you look in the um, enlargement, the crystal structure, which contains highly ordered chlorine and sodium ions, is now broken up by water, and water molecules surround the chlorine ions and the sodium ions. The oxygen part of the water molecules orient themselves to interact with the positively charged in yellow sodium ions, and the hydrogen parts of the water molecules interact with the green part, which is the negatively charged chlorine ions, and they form a shell surrounding those ions. So they essentially break up the crystal structure of the salt, making it dissolve. True ionic bonds do not exist in a cell. Remember what I told you in the first video and asked you why that is? Well, this is the reason why that is, because an ionic compound really is a highly ordered crystal structure of ions forming ionic bonds. In water, these crystal structures are broken up, they are dissolved. So there are no true ionic bonds in a cell because a cell is water-based. Water can also dissolve compounds made of non-ionic but polar molecules. And it doesn't matter how large the molecule is, as long as it has some kind of polar or charged surface, it can form hydrogen bonds with water. And in this picture, a protein is shown, which is a large biological molecule, and you could see the hydration shell of water. So water basically covers the surface of that protein. Whenever there is a polar or charged surface on the protein, water will form hydrogen bonds. There are two types of substances, and you're familiar with this. Their substances can be either hydrophilic, hydro, water, philic comes from love, Greek word for love, and hydrophobic from the Greek word of phobia, fear. Hydrophilic substances have affinity for water. They like water. They can be dissolved in water because they have polar or charged properties. Hydrophobic substances do not have polar or charged properties. So they fear water. They are repelled by water. They do not mix with water. Oil and water do not mix. Well, oils and fats are hydrophobic substances. They do not contain um, polar or charged surfaces or groups. So they are not dissolving in water. Why is this important for life? Why is the property of water to be its universal solvent property, nearly universal solvent property, important for life? Because a cell, which is the smallest unit of life, really is a miniature factory, chemical factory. Hundreds of chemical reactions involving thousands of molecules occur inside every cell. And these chemical reactions are what sustains life. Now, if water can dissolve hundreds of different molecules, thousands of different molecules, that means chemical reactions can occur because chemical reactions occur in a solution. So water being able to dissolve all of these molecules enables the chemical reactions that sustain life to occur. Another emergent property of water that contributes to life is its ability to moderate temperature. Water can absorb heat from warmer air and release stored heat to cooler air. So during the day, water will absorb the heat from the air and at night, it will slowly release some of that heat back into the air, which means that the temperature of the air will never get extreme. It'll never get extremely hot or extremely cold. Water can absorb or release a large amount of heat with only slight change of its own temperature. This is because water has high specific heat. It means that it takes a large amount of heat to change water's temperature by one degree. And because water can absorb and release a lot of heat without changing its temperature, it is slow to heat and slow to cool down. And here is a 
graph showing you the heating curve of water. On the x-axis, you will see um, the amount of heat that's being added to water. On the y-axis is the temperature change of water. And you see how much heat needs to be added before water can actually start evaporating and changing its temperature. The high specific heat of water really is what keeps temperatures changing drastically going from like extremely hot to extremely cold. It keeps the temperature within the limits that permit life to exist. Our planet is 75% ocean. So we're not too close to the sun. We're not too far away. We are at such a distance from the sun as a planet that would allow life to exist. Nonetheless, the sun delivers heat, the sun delivers energy to earth, not uniformly. There's daytime, there's nighttime, there's different distances from the equator, there's different seasons. If there was no water or if there's a lot less water on earth, if the oceans were to be reduced even by a few percent, then life would not be able to exist. Why is that? Because the water of the oceans limits how hot it can get on the planet or how cold it can get. It allows the temperatures not to go too, too hot or too cold. And this can also be illustrated in, by looking at this map of local uh, weather, local climate. So Los Angeles in the hottest days of summer is 75 degrees. Whereas Burbank or San Bernardino have much higher temperature. Why? Because they're further away from the water. So the further away you are from the water, the higher the air temperature will get. Why? Because water absorbs some of the heat from the sun. And it will moderate air temperature. Another important feature is the high heat of vaporization, which is used in evaporative cooling. And again, I want you to look at this graph and you see how long the graph stays flat at 100 degrees. So you keep adding heat, yet the water remains at 100 degrees, remains liquid, and eventually it evaporates. But it takes a lot of heat, a lot of energy for water to turn from liquid to gas or to evaporate. This feature of water is used in evaporative cooling. Evaporative cooling is when mammals sweat. They use um, the fact that water will absorb a lot of heat before it evaporates, leaving the underlying surface cooler. So it is used for us to maintain homeostasis and to maintain relatively constant body temperature. Expansion upon freezing, ice floats. Ice, which is the solid form of water, is less dense than the liquid form, and for that reason, it floats. Why does ice float? Well, it floats because when, as the temperature is lowered, the hydrogen bonds become more stable. And water, in its um, solid form, becomes like a crystal, almost like the sodium chloride crystals very highly ordered. The distance between the water molecules is fixed. And there's a lot of space between all the water molecules. A lot of space means less density. In a liquid form, the water molecules are constantly bumping into each other. There's less space because hydrogen bonds are constantly formed, reformed, broken. So there's a lot more molecule movement and the molecules are packed more tightly together than they are in ice. So ice, more space, less dense, it'll float. Why is ice floating important? Well, oceans and lakes do not freeze solid, and that's very important. The surface ice insulates the water below. Insulates means it creates a barrier between the water and the frigid air. The heat that is produced by organisms living in water is trapped beneath the ice, and the frigid air is not really touching the water below the ice. So the water below the ice is kept warmer than the air, 
which allows for the water to remain liquid and which allows life to exist in winter, in cold temperatures, in lakes, and in oceans. If I sink, ponds and lakes and even oceans would freeze solid, and in summer only the upper few inches would thaw, which means life wouldn't be able to exist. And remember, life started in the oceans. So in order for life to continue in water, we cannot have lakes, rivers, or even oceans free solid. Finally, we're gonna talk about the cohesive and adhesive properties of water. And remember, cohesion is when water molecules interact with each other. Adhesion is when they actually interact with other polar molecules. Cohesion and adhesion are important for two properties, capillary action and surface tension. Surface tension allows insects to walk on water and lay their eggs, therefore, thereby escaping predators. There's even a small lizard called the basilisk lizard or the Jesus lizard because it can literally run on water to escape predators. And in after, at the end of this video, I will post the link to this video by National Geographic that actually shows you how the lizard runs on water and escapes a snake, its predator. Fun fact, why do we wash our hands with soap? Because the surface tension of water will make actually droplets of water just like the droplets I showed you on the leaf of the plant. So when you're washing your hands, you're gonna have droplets on your skin. Well, we don't want droplets. We want like a film of water so that water can just rinse off stuff. It can get rid of dirt, can get rid of bacteria and viruses. When we're using soap, the soap will break the surface tension and water will not form droplets. Instead, it will thoroughly wet you and therefore you'll be able to rinse off really well. For that reason, it's very important that we wash our hands with soap because soap will make water really rinse well off, rinse you off well. So capillary reaction, what's capillary reaction? If you insert a straw in a drink, you will see how the liquid starts climbing up the straw. It climbs up against gravity. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because the straw is narrow, a narrow tube. And in a narrow tube, the water molecules will bind to each other and they'll also bind to the surface of the straw. And essentially they'll be climbing up against gravity. This property is very important because this is how plants, vascular plants get water all the way from the roots to the top of the plant. And especially in tall trees, imagine how far water has to travel. So plants have these tiny little tubes, tiny little vessels, similar to our blood vessels, except they transport water all the way from the roots throughout the whole plant using this property called capillary action. Without capillary action, plants wouldn't be able to thrive. And this is the end of our video. Remember, non-GMO alkaline water at pH 9.5 can be bought at Whole Foods. We're gonna talk more about pH and buffers in the next video. That's it for now. Have fun.